When's the last time you thought about, pondered, even for a brief moment, walking away from the faith? How bad, how difficult do things have to get before you start to feel tempted to turn away from faith in Jesus? I want to talk with you this morning about perseverance about walking with Jesus for the long haul, about hanging in there. Last week I took my son for a campus visit um, to the University of Oklahoma, which is where his mother and I went and where we met. And um, during that trip I got to reconnect with an old friend of mine, uh, Mark Robinson. Mark and I went to school together 20 years ago now, and uh, we both went to seminary after that. We're both pastors now. Uh, Mark was in my wedding as a groomsman and one of my dearest friends to this day. We don't see each other a lot because we live in different states, but it was great to sort of reconnect. And so we got together and had dinner. And one of the stories we revisited was the fact that as we were students, um, one of the things we did during our senior year at the University of Oklahoma was every Sunday night at 9 p.m., Mark and I got together to pray for an hour. And we would go up to the ninth floor of the Sarkis Energy Center, which is a faculty office building on campus. And on the ninth floor sort of looks out over the campus and you can see the whole thing. And so we would stand up there looking out the window and just praying for revival and for renewal and for the work of the Holy Spirit on our campus. Well, we did that all year and this exact week during our senior year, Easter week, we decided, you know what, we want to take it up a notch. Uh, We want to take it up even higher in terms of our commitment to prayer. And so we decided what we wanted to do is on Good Friday, after going to Good Friday service at church, we were going to stay up all night and pray. I mean, Jesus' disciples couldn't do it in the Garden of Gethsemane, but we were like, hey, let's give this a try. So after the Good Friday service, we went to our spot on the ninth floor and we settled in and sought to give ourselves to an entire night, nine or ten hours consecutively of prayer until the sun came up on Saturday morning. Now, here's what I can tell you. The prayers we prayed between about 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., I don't know that they were even coherent. I know the Lord answers prayer. I know the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. That was about the only intercession that was happening because we were so... Disco- in- incoherent in our speech and in our ability to sort of track. And I would start praying and just lose my train of thought and be like, what are we even doing right now? But here's what that experience taught us. Mark and I revisited that last Thursday night at dinner. We're like, hey man, you know the story I tell us that one night? You remember when we stayed up all night to pray? He said, I've never done that since. That was kind of crazy. But here's what we learned in that experience is that um, perseverance matters. Right, like, even in seasons when you don't feel like you have anything to offer, God is pleased with perseverance. God is pleased when you hang in there, even when you feel like, I don't really have anything to give right now, I don't have anything to offer right now. It's perseverance, it's faithfulness that honors God. We've been in this study of First Peter that we're calling Life in Exile. And Peter is framing out for us this reality. As Christians, we are citizens of the kingdom of God who live in this world. And therefore, we live life in exile. We're like people from another country who are here for a while. This is where we live. We're really present here, but this isn't home. And so he's been working out these themes of what does it mean to live life sort of as a resident alien, as someone who's here but not from here. And as Peter closes this excellent epistle, as he draws it to a close for us this morning, here's the point he's making. A key part of life in exile is perseverance. Your job as a Christian is to persevere. To hang in there. To not let go of faith in the Lord Jesus. Now, there's a divine side to perseverance, right? 
I mean, we think of texts like Jesus in the Gospel of John chapter 10 when He says, My sheep know My voice and no one will snatch them out of My hand. Or we think of great Gospel promises like Romans 8 where Paul says, Neither height nor depth nor anything in all creation will separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. So we know that there's a divine side to perseverance. God has promised His faithfulness to us. But there's also a human side to perseverance, right? There's also a human side to perseverance. There's us not quitting. Us not giving up. This is why the Bible repeatedly exhorts us, hey, hold on to the faith you've professed. Take care lest there be in you an unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. There's a human side to perseverance. And listen, the divine aspect of perseverance, God's faithfulness to us, and the human aspect of faithfulness, our persevering, are not in conflict with each other. Part of how God maintains us in the faith is by empowering us to keep the faith. And part of what we're doing when we're keeping the faith is resting in the promises that God has made. These things work together. And so as Peter closes this great letter that he's written, he wants to encourage us and urge us and exhort us about perseverance. He wants the Christians living at his time and the Christians living in our time to know, hey, things are difficult. Life brings with it challenges and suffering. Here's the calling. Hang in there. Don't give up. So here's the outline for this morning. Quite simply, I want to talk about the need for perseverance. I want to talk about the threat to perseverance. And I want to talk about the means of perseverance. The need for perseverance, the threat to perseverance, and the means of perseverance. So let's look first of all at the need for perseverance. If you have a Bible, 1 Peter chapter 5 is where we will be. You've already heard the text Red, let's examine it together now. Look with me at 1 Peter 5 and verse 12. The Apostle Peter says to us, By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. There's the exhortation. Stand firm firm in it. Peter says, I've written this epistle so that I can frame out for you and help you understand the grace of God in Christ. I've done my best to explain it and to lay it out. Stand firm in it. This call to stand firm echoes other passages in the New Testament that point us to the same thing. For instance, look at 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. The Apostle Paul says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. Or literally the text says that you might be able to stand up under it. Temptation is going to come, but listen, God's going to enable you to stand your ground. Stand. Or we might think of that passage in Ephesians chapter 6 where Paul says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. So we see repeatedly this exhortation, stand firm, hold your ground, don't give up, don't give in. The Scriptures are telling you, stand. There's a need for perseverance. Now the opposite of standing is what? Falling. Or you might say sitting. I mean, there's lots of opposites you could think of. All right? Biblically, the opposite is falling. Right? If you don't stand, you fall. And so we have, for instance, this contrast in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Here's what that verse ought to provoke in us. It ought to provoke the awareness that perseverance is not passive. Hey, don't just assume that you stand. If you take this lightly, then take heed. 
lest you fall. Perseverance is not passive. Perseverance is active. Perseverance is something we need to pursue and engage in. So these exhortations to stand firm matter for us. Peter wants you to see, first of all, the need for perseverance. Hey, look, you're living in exile. Life as a Christian in the world isn't always easy. There are going to come challenges and circumstantial variables, and the calling is stand firm. The need for perseverance. So we see the need, we see the exhortation here at the end of 1 Peter 5. Let's look now at the threat to perseverance. The threat to perseverance. Here's what you must reckon with. There are deep spiritual forces at work to undermine and destroy and erode your faith in Christ. I know we live in a mostly rationalistic age that has largely abandoned belief in anything like Satan or demons or dark powers or supernatural evil. However, I also know that you have experienced moments in life where you have sensed fear and apprehension that you can't entirely explain. I know you've met people in your life, not very many, but maybe one or two in your lifetime that seem evil in a way that's very dark and sinister. I know that deep down you believe in the reality of evil even if you sort of laugh it off in polite conversation. The Bible teaches here in 1 Peter 5 that belief in dark spiritual powers is the exact opposite of superstition. It is in fact sobriety. It's just common sense. It's not superstitious at all. Look at 1 Peter 5, 8. Be, catch this, be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Oh, that's superstition! Or is it? That deep tension that you're having in your marriage, do you really think that's just a personality difference? That pull that you have toward your smartphone right as you sit down to read the Bible, do you really think that's accidental? That random text message from the ex-boyfriend who just happens to be in town and wants to get together, do you really think that's coincidence? My brother lives in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, he's got a wife and three young kids. He has a little son who's about two years old now. And he, a couple weeks ago, came home from some shopping with his son, two-year-old son. And uh, he texted me. He said, hey, I just got home from shopping. I was going to send Micah out into the backyard to play by himself for a while while I unloaded the van. And I, I went to open the back door, and here's what I found. And he sent me a photo. I don't know if you can see, do you see that right under the palm tree right there? That's a bobcat. This is why the mascot is the Arizona wildcats, because there really are wildcats roaming the desert of Tucson, Arizona, and they hang out in your backyard every once in a while. Now, obviously, sending a two-year-old to play in the backyard with that predator there would be a bad idea, Right? This is exactly the metaphor that Peter's using. He's saying, listen, there is a very real threat to your perseverance and you need to be watchful. Satan prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. There's a metaphor here that's supposed to awaken in us wariness and watchfulness and wisdom. Now, let's be honest. Some Christians have been guilty of sloppy thinking here, right? 
There are Christians who their understanding of spiritual evil is there's a demon around every corner. And so lest we not make that mistake, let's understand the Bible's very nuanced view of spiritual evil. I want you to draw your eyes across the page to 1 Peter 5.13. And I want you to notice this reference. She who is at Babylon sends you greetings. Most scholars agree that this is a veiled reference to Rome. That Peter is likely writing this letter from the city of Rome to the churches in Asia Minor. And, and so he's saying, hey, the church here in Rome sends you greetings. So why does he call Rome Babylon? Quite simply, because Rome is more than a city. There's something deeper that lies underneath and behind the political and economic and social power of a city like Rome. Uh, let me read an extended quote from the British theologian Leslie Newbigin to help you get your mind around what's at work here. Here's what Newbigin says. We all know very well that long-enduring institutions have something. A good school has a spirit, an ethos, which molds the character of the pupils. It was there before they came, and it will be there after the present pupils have left. A nation similarly has something which is not just the sum of the attitudes of its individual citizens. And a mob can become an embodiment of evil, an evil which its individual members would never have wished for on their own. This something which is invisible is nevertheless real. Terribly real. It is the spiritual power that is, how shall we say it? Behind, within, and above human beings. These powers do not exist apart from the human agencies in which they are embodied. Pilate, Herod, Caiaphas. Yet, they are not identical with these particular individuals. The king dies, but the kingship goes on. Another king steps into the place. But what is this thing we call kingship? The principalities and powers are realities. We may not be able to visualize them, to locate them, or to say exactly what they are, but we are foolish if we pretend they do not exist. They do not exist as disembodied entities floating above this world or lurking within us. They meet us as embodied, invisible, and tangible realities. People, nations, and institutions. Caiaphas and Herod and Pilate acted as representatives of what the New Testament calls the world. This present age. Nubigen wants us to understand and see that spiritual powers are at work underneath and within some of the institutions in society. In other words, listen to me, Bashar al-Assad is more than just a bad man. Are you with me? There's a power underneath and behind him. But let's not just go Assad, that's the easy one this week, right? But the same thing is true of institutions like Wall Street. Hollywood, Silicon Valley, the modern university. Underneath and behind these entities are very real spiritual forces. And that's not to say that everything about those entities is dark and bad and demonic, but it is to say the structural evil we confront in those places is present because of spiritual evil behind and underneath it. So, to chip away 
at your perseverance in the faith. Satan doesn't need to send a horde of demons to torment you. He just needs you to binge on Netflix. He just needs you to become addicted to your smartphone. He just needs you anxious about your investment portfolio. These are the subtle ways that Babylon works its influence in our lives. This is why Christians need to perpetually be watchful about the forms of entertainment we consume and the technologies we give ourselves to. It's not because we're prude and anti-modern and we can't handle those things. It is because This is the way Babylon works its influence on our lives. In verse 9, Peter says, the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. In other words, friends, Babylon is everywhere. Babylon is every city. Around the world, in every culture, the powers of evil are at work in ways we don't always reckon with. The threat to perseverance is very real, and it's not going to come at us through demonic attack, but it likely will come at us through the chipping away at our convictions through continued immersion in the city of man rather than keeping our eyes and allegiances focused on the city of God. The threat to perseverance is more tangible and more embodied than you might think. So Peter says, we need perseverance. Stand firm. He says, understand the threat to perseverance. A devil who is very real and a world system Babylon, that is the vehicle by which dark spiritual powers are at work on us. And so now let's look at the means of perseverance. How do we stand firm in the true grace of God? Quite simply, the answer is worship. And I don't mean singing songs on Sunday morning. That's an aspect of worship. What I mean is, we stand firm, we persevere by remembering and delighting in what is true. Remembering and delighting in what is really true about God, about the world, and about ourselves. To say it another way, the battle is a battle of trust. It's a battle of confidence. It's a battle of what will you count on as really true when it really matters. And Peter's going to go Trinitarian on us here, like a good Orthodox apostle. Right? First of all, he wants to remind us, hey, remember the grace and glory of the Father. To persevere, to hang in there. Remember, don't forget the grace and the glory of the Father. In verse 10, he says, After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace. You know what grace is? It's God's undeserved favor and goodness. Peter wants to remind us, listen, here's the God we serve. A God who is limitless in grace. Not a God who reacts and responds to us based on, were we good enough today? Did we persevere right today? How was our thought life today? How was our devotional life today? But rather, a God who exists to just pour out on us abundant grace. we got to be anchored in reminding ourselves of the nature of God is a God who delights to pour His goodness into and upon His people. There's limitless resources for us in the Father. He's the God of all grace. And not only that, but He goes on to say, 
who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ. When life is difficult, when the circumstances of life are challenging, when pain and turmoil in the world causes us to begin to feel doubtful and despairing, we need to lift our eyes to the reality of the eternal glory of the kingdom of God. To Him be dominion forever and ever. Listen, whatever you're facing right now is temporary. However interminable it seems, it's temporary, but God's glory is eternal. God's dominion is forever. Listen to me. Assad's regime is temporary. Putin's regime is temporary. Donald Trump is temporary. Everything, every ruler, every leader in the world, their dominion and their authority is temporary, but God's dominion is eternal. And one of the things we have to always remind ourselves of is, listen, we're called into this eternal glory. This is what anchors us and animates us and causes us to persevere is remembering and knowing God is eternally glorious and He's caught us up into that. Remember the grace and glory of the Father. Second, I told you he's going Trinitarian. Remember the victory of the Son. Remember the victory of the Son. Look at the end of verse 10. After you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Do you see what the Apostle is teaching you in that verse? He's preparing you for, you know what? What you're suffering right now might not go away tomorrow. You may suffer for a little while. But, when that is over, God the Father of grace and glory, will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. It's guaranteed. It's going to happen. It's absolute. How does He know this? How can He say, listen, Christian, whatever you're facing right now, there will be strengthening and confirmation and restoring and establishing for you. How does He know that's true for you? Because of what Jesus has already done. Eternity is already in flight. The victory has already been accomplished. Jesus has already lived, died, risen from the dead, and ascended back into heaven. His dominion is forever. And because of what Jesus has done, Peter guarantees you, look, whatever's going on right now, the future is beautiful for you if you're in Christ. So, remember the victory of the Son. Remember, the battle's already been fought. And finally, remember the work of the Spirit. Verse 14, the very last verse of the very last chapter of 1 Peter ends this way. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. What a blessed phrase. In Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one who places us in Christ who unites us with the Lord Jesus and gives us a new identity so that now we are mystically united with the Lord Jesus Christ in faith and baptism. And Peter wants to say, listen, whatever else is going on, whatever suffering, whatever trouble you're enduring, remember this, you're in Christ. And that's why I can offer you peace. Because nothing that happens in this world can corrupt or erase the fact that by the grace of the Holy Spirit, you've been placed in Christ. And because of what the Spirit has done to cause you to be in Christ, you're part of a family. Um, throughout this text, he uses this language, um, your brotherhood throughout the world, verse 9. Sylvanus, a faithful brother, verse 12. Mark, my son, verse 13. There's this familial language. What Peter's saying is, look, the Spirit has united us in Christ. And listen, community matters for the sake of perseverance, doesn't it? Like, when you're struggling, it's good to know, oh, I got, I got people around me who, who are part of this same thing. 
I got friends around me who are in Christ and who can encourage me, pray for me, care for me, challenge me, help me believe and be grounded in the promises of God. Remember the work of the Spirit. Friends, worship is the means of perseverance. How are we going to persevere? We're going to do it by remembering the grace and glory of the Father, the victory of the Son, the work of the Spirit, and remembering it over and over and over and over again. Never letting our minds and hearts forget it. Never letting our souls get dull to its realities. That's why it's so important that we gather here for worship every week. That's what we're doing. Is we're just reminding ourselves of what's true. This is why in our worship, it's not just, hey, let's sing, but also let's say words that remind us of what's true. Because we need to remember and be grounded in reality. This is why it matters so much that we cultivate lives of worship throughout the week. Because look, if this is the only time you're worshiping, and then sort of Monday through Saturday, you're just trying to survive, it's going to be really challenging. Right? You're made to be a worshiper every day of your life as you remind yourself and soak your heart in the truths of what God has done in Christ. We need to persevere. There are very real threats to our perseverance, but God has given wonderful means for us to persevere. We need to remember. We need to delight in what's really true. On October 9th, 1941, in the midst of the Second World War, Winston Churchill delivered an address to an all-boys preparatory school in England. It was a school he himself had attended as a young lad, and as always, Churchill's words at this moment were full of conviction and depth. Listen to what he said as he reflected on the war. Quote, we must learn to be equally good at what is short and sharp and at what is long and tough. Appearances are often very deceptive. You cannot tell from appearances how things will go. Surely from the past ten months, this is the lesson. Never give Never give in. Never, 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 in nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in. We stood all alone a year ago, and to many countries it seemed that our account was closed. But instead, our country stood in the gap. And by what seemed almost a miracle to those outside these islands, Though we ourselves never doubted it, we now find ourselves in a position where I say that we can be sure that we have only to persevere to conquer. These are not dark days. These are great days. The greatest days our country has ever lived. And we must all thank God that we have been allowed to play a part in making these days memorable in the history of our race. What a difference perspective makes. Friends, because Jesus has already won the victory, we have only to persevere to conquer. The fact is, we live in a culture, a day, a time that is increasingly resistant to the gospel. Some Christians are saying, these are dark days. But these are not dark days. These are great days. What better time has there been to be a Christian with conviction? What an amazing moment to be on the earth representing the Lord Jesus Christ and extending His kingdom in the world. What a clear moment for us to declare our allegiance and to persevere in the work God has given us. Fellow Christians, inspired by Peter's exhortation and by this whole book and this whole theme that he's developed, 
let's make up our minds this morning to never, 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 never give in. Let's pray. God, that's our hope. That's our longing. That's our desire. Galvanize our hearts with commitment and intention to persevere. And at the same time, make us mindful of our need to depend on You, to rely on You, to rest in Your grace. Let us not use the human realities of perseverance to obscure the divine, nor let us use Your divine promises of perseverance to obscure our responsibility, but rather, let us rest this morning in the fact that You have promised Your faithfulness to us. And the fact that Peter, the Apostle, is urging us, stand firm in the true grace of God. So Jesus, by Your grace, would You make us a people who stand firm. Who never give up. Help us decide, commit, and intend to remain faithful to You. And then pour Your grace and favor on that intention. For the sake of your name and glory. Amen.